Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for that introduction. So, yep, today I would like to talk to you about why I believe that big data is good data. And I'm going to explain why I think that by talking through another passion of mine, which is cities. So some of you may already be aware, but in 2008, we passed an important tipping point globally, whereby now more people live in cities than they do in rural environments across the world. And that trend is set to continue. We have millions of people moving into cities across the world so that by the time a majority of this audience is retirement age, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. Cities are also proving slightly problematic. They are the cornerstones of consumption. They take up just 3% of the world's land surface area, and yet they're responsible for 75% of global resource consumption. So when we're thinking about sustainability, that battle will either be won or indeed lost in our cities. Thirdly, cities are proving to be more powerful than ever. We are seeing mayors to become pragmatic global leaders willing to take on issues that nation states are struggling with. They're also willing to collaborate, to come together. And the compact of mayors at the recent UN Climate Summit in September was testament to this. So whilst we have this rise of the city with all its challenges and its opportunities, we also have within the same generation an incredible shift, and that is the digital revolution. The internet has transformed our lives. It's funny. So when I, I, I think back to a time when I was at home after school, and a gentleman came to the door, a salesman, and he was selling encyclopedias. And these were physical books that you would buy and you would have on your bookshelf and you would refer to them when you were doing your homework. <laughs> it's like, it's life before Google and it feels like an eon ago, but, you know, I don't consider myself to be that old. And, you know, so this is not just about how the internet has also transformed the way we search for information, the way we educate ourselves. This is also about the fact that all manner of appliances and devices are increasingly online, increasingly connected. To the point that by next year, there'll be double the number of devices online than there are people on the planet. And it's not each of these devices, these tiny sensors, these, these smart TVs, these connected cars, they're each creating a tiny, continuous vapor trail. And it's the aggregation of these vapor trails into a common place which creates the big of big data. 90% of the data that exists today did not exist three years ago. Which is crazy, right? And so, when we're thinking about we have the rise of the city, and we have the explosion of big data. It's when you bring these two things together, it's at this point of convergence that I think things get really interesting. And that's the exact field of work that I'm in. So in the context of the city, you have these millions of data streams being generated. So New York generates a terabyte of data a day. And this data is coming from traffic lights, from energy meters, from people's mobile phones. And it's the ability to bring together these data streams allows you to better sense the city, to better understand its metabolism in real time, to better match supply with demand for resources. 
And it's my belief that this is the tool that we use to better design and run our cities in the future to secure their future prosperity. So perhaps if I could give you a couple of examples. So the first example is um, in, in US cities and in the context of crime. So the use of acoustic sensors which are calibrated to detect gunshots have shown that while people assumed that people would report a gunshot heard around 80% of the time it was heard, the reality was actually people only reported it around 10% of the time. So imagine this asset class to be able to understand in which neighbourhoods, in which times of night or day these things are occurring. That helps the police to deploy precious resources. A second completely different example, and this time it's really interesting because they're, they're using the public to actually help gather their big data sets. So in the case of Amsterdam, they're actually providing citizens with smart umbrellas which have the ability to detect the level of rainfall at any given time. And combined with the smart app on citizens' phones, they are then becoming the sensors that the crowdsource sensing that enables the city to understand the real-time propensity for flood risk. And that's just two good data examples. I think if we took a step back and perhaps if I'd asked you when you walked into the auditorium this afternoon, what do you think of when you think of big data? I think uh, a majority of people would have connotations of Google, of Facebook. We might presume that this, this new commodity is something that requires a complex machinery to refine it and is something that will remain the auspices of large private sector players, maybe a bit like oil. And don't get me wrong, I think companies like Google and Facebook they have a role to play in this future economy. But I would like to posit that it's our cities that stand to benefit the most. But that's if we get the right mindset. And critically, it's if we get the public and the private sector working together effectively. This first came, came into my consciousness around three years ago. I was working with the city of Copenhagen um, and we were starting, as we do, to, to unpack the challenges of the city and figure out how, how could we solve for them. And so one area that Copenhagen are, are interested in, in, in helping, in solving for, is they want to reduce the energy spend of the municipal building stock. So they own over a thousand buildings across the city and they want to reduce that energy expenditure and the emissions that go with it. A second area they're looking to improve is they want to be able to make it easier for people to find a car parking space when they arrive in the city centre to stop them from driving around looking for a car parking spot and reducing local air quality causing emissions. And as we dug into this problem, it became clear that the city had a really good grasp on the problem from their side. So they understood where the municipal parking spaces were and how they were used. They understood where their buildings were, what size they were, you know, what their uses were. But they didn't have an important piece of the puzzle, which was how were the private garages within the city used? And how does their energy spend, for example, compare with other buildings that are similar size? Because that's held by the utility company. And it's really... You need to bring together these two parts of the puzzle to be able to have a holistic view on urban challenges. But here's the tricky bit, which is how do you get the private sector to be involved? What is their incentive? Ultimately, there is a cost affiliated with capturing these data streams, with, with storing them, with providing them to a, a common platform for common good. And they're, they're private. They, they have shareholders. They need to 
show financial returns and be remunerated. And that's when we came across the idea of the urban information marketplace. So the urban information marketplace is the bringing together of public and private data into a common platform, which digital entrepreneurs can then subscribe to to access data streams to create innovative apps and services to make cities more effective. And this could be open data, public data, which has already been paid for through taxation, or it could be proprietary data streams which have been gathered by the private sector for which there is a value attributed. And suddenly you've got a sustainable business model and suddenly it's not just the public sector trying to fix the public sector. A whole pool of innovators are invited to this problem solving. So why isn't this coming through faster? I think, intuitively, a lot of people would agree that this, this seems like a good concept. But I think there's three reasons why, why this isn't coming through faster. And firstly, I think this is related to the fact that this is technically complex. There are millions of data streams that need to come together, and they need to be organized, they need to be anonymized, they need to be applied the appropriate digital rights and offered out appropriately. And that is technically complex, but I think possible. Secondly, the public sector need to lead. If this is going to be successful, if this is going to have the appropriate trust and the appropriate governance model, then we need to have the public sector as the key protagonist. And although digital innovators in the public sector are on the rise, they are still a rare breed. Thirdly, there's the issues of data privacy and cybersecurity, which are valid and which warrant a good discussion. But I really believe that stringent legislative regimes could slow this down to the point that it's counterproductive. And when I look at um, examples from the Netherlands, whereby the rollout of smart energy meters to homes was held up in court for two years because of concerns over infringement of human rights, I think we cannot forget the opportunity cost of inaction. And when I think about examples from the printing press, press imagine if that had undergone stringent legislation in its early years, how that would have slowed the important transmission of ideas. We are about to repeat the next, the, sorry, we are about to repeat the last 400 years of civilization building over the next four decades. And we have a choice. We either do that relatively blind using the techniques that we've used for the past few decades, using intuition versus data-driven decisions, rehashing the same mistakes, or we use the tools we have. We experiment with data sharing. We bring together the public and private, and we reinvent Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired magazine, often talks to the power of technology to change our lives. He puts forward that all technology is inherently good and that it's up to us as society to find the appropriate use for it. He gives the example of nuclear and speaks to the fact that although it can be used in the context of nuclear weapons, it can also create thousands of terawatt hours of emission-free power for our increasingly hot planet. So my suggestion 
is that we put big data to the best use we can possible. That we bring together public and private. That we invite innovate, sorry, entrepreneurs to the problem solving. And that we make big data, good data, for the future of our cities, for everyone. Thank you.